Jones. Keep the applause going till he gets here. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, Renee. Good afternoon, people of God. It is good to be here with you. Let me congratulate you, extend congratulations to you on this the occasion of uh, your conference. And uh, I trust that it has been wonderful so far. I have been getting some of the, the feedback and some of the video clips. And I, I know it has been good, but I trust that for you, it has been good. And we are happy to be here with you. Um, the daughter is uh, Zanele Nekeva. You got the son perfect. Uh, so give yourself a clap, Renee. Zaken Asiel. And you almost got the daughter, Zanele Nekeva. And um, we are happy to be here with you. You would have heard of the author, author side of me. And uh, so for those who are here and for those on Zoom, this is what the, one of the books looks like. This was the first one to be published. Let's major in the minors. If you are online, you can jump on Amazon quickly and you'll find it there on Amazon. That's what it looks like. If you are in Jamaica, wherever you are, you can contact me and uh, make arrangements to get your copy. We will get it to you wherever you are in Jamaica. And if you are online, and if you are online, of course, it's available from Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and um, just about any of the other digital platforms. And um, copies are available locally as well. It's available on Amazon Kindle, as well as a hard copy you can obtain from Amazon. All right. Divine imperatives for the family. Let's quickly uh, demystify the, 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 the terms in the topic. Divine, of course, you're familiar with. You're familiar with having your divine worship service on weekends, um, on Sabbath. And so, of course, divine has to do with, with God, the deity. Um, and then um, imperative, command, instructions, a mandate. So when we talk about divine imperatives for the family, we are referring to what are those things that God has commanded for the family? What, what, is, what are the expectations that God has for the family? And of course, those naturally arise from the scriptures, from the word of God. What are the must-dos? The things that we need to give serious consideration to with a view to obeying because they are the imperatives. They are the commands that have come from God as far as the family is concerned. And so naturally, as you can imagine, the Bible contains a number of these imperatives. God has written down several very clear commands that the family is to execute. Obviously, therefore, we would only be able to look at just a few. All right? And so this by no means is meant to be an exhaustive or a treatment of all the imperatives. I'm just going to uh, take a particular line a particular focus and you have heard in the introduction that i am a public theologian public theology takes the approach of connecting the study of god to public affairs as opposed to systematic theology for example which looks at the the broad concepts of the nature of god so you talk about salvation, you talk about um, atonement, you talk about the doctrine of Christ, and so on. Public theology goes one step further. What is the connection of all of that to public affairs? The things that affect you and I in everyday life. And so because that is the particular approach that I take to a theology, the study of God, 
whenever I come to topics such as these, I like to take a particular narrowed focus, for the most part, on national issues, critical social issues, sociological problems, issues that we have to contend with, where the rubber meets the road, as it were. And so that's just me giving you a sense of where we are going or where we are seeking to go in the presentation. So we're going to be touching on, on, on a lot of on social issues as far as the family under God is expected to do. We're not talking here now about lofty ideas, things that we, we sing about when we are in worship or things that we may read about and even recite because we know the verse. I'm talking about the things that God expects the family to do. And if we do those things, then we would actually, in actual fact, be partnering with God in the establishment of the kingdom of God here on earth, which in fact is what we are called to do. We are called to be people of the kingdom of God, citizens of the kingdom of God. That's our identity. And our task as citizens of the kingdom of God is to bring the kingdom of God into earth's realm. I don't think, I, I'm not sure if we get it. Because it is, it is so missed by the body of Christ. That is precisely what was in the mind of Jesus when his disciples asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray. Notice, the disciples did not say, Lord, teach us what to pray. Now, language is very important. And the words that we say are very important because they convey specific things. Asking, Lord, teach us what to pray is very different from asking, Lord, teach us how to pray. But you know what we have done? We have treated the response of Jesus to that question from the disciples as if they asked him what to pray. And so every time we recite what we call, what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer, we are behaving as if this is what, as if Jesus was telling us what to pray. He wasn't. He was teaching the disciples how to pray. And so every line of what his response was is intended to be a model of how our prayers should be. Now the line that says, the line I, I, that got me there to just teaching you that, is a line that says, let your kingdom come. When you pray, say, let your kingdom come. Let your prayers be prayers that indicate to God that you understand his desire, his will, that his kingdom come. That his kingdom be established in earth. You are saying, Lord, I value your kingdom being a reality in earth. And I want your kingdom to be established in earth. And I am interested in and available to ensuring I am willing and I am prepared to play my part in ensuring that your kingdom come. Similarly, let your will be done 
on earth, how? Just as it is done in heaven. That's what those words in the prayer are about. And so the family is intended by God to pursue certain actions. Divine imperatives for the family. Let me just kind of set some early ones and then just go quickly to where I want to focus. And then I'll end with a couple others. So the first one I want to share with us comes from the very beginning. If we go back to where it all began, in the book of Genesis, in the early chapters, the first divine imperative for the family, which is very obvious, and I think most of us understand it or are, 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 would be aware of it at the most basic level. And that is the reproductive imperative. That the family instituted by God has been given the command by God or we have a command from God to reproduce. Where do we find this? Where do we find the reproductive imperative? In the book of Genesis. In? Be fruitful. In the words, be fruitful and multiply. Chapter, chapter 2. Yeah? Fill the earth. Yeah? That's the reproductive imperative. That the family is expected to reproduce. Now, like I said, I think we, we have that at the, at the most basic level. Um, and so, we, we have a, an appreciation for marriage and for having children. No, that's, that's basic. I want us to go a little deeper though. Arising out of this imperative, a couple of considerations. Why is God interested in us obeying this command? Why is this important? It is important, again, obviously, for the continuity of the species. There, I saw uh, very recently, I believe, if it was not the week just gone, would have been last week, uh, last week or the week before, where the information emerging right here in Jamaica is that over the last two years, there has been a decrease in the birth rate. In other words, less babies were born. The interesting thing is that a number of other countries have released a similar report. As a matter of fact, China, who has a long history of reproductive control, and of course, you, you, uh, you perhaps, perhaps know that China is the most populous country in the world. Right? Um, and so they have, they have been exercising reproductive control. You know what China started doing recently? Paying couples to have more children, to reproduce. Because it's obvious, if the birth rate declines, continues to decline, eventually we're going to have less and less human beings around. Duh, it's time to naturally. Eh? So for the species, for the human race to perpetuate, to continue, God gave the command that we should be fruitful and multiply. But also, for the preservation of the creation, now, which is linked to the second imperative, which we'll say, I'll say, touch on in a moment, which is the stewardship imperative, that in order for the creation, God's intention, to continue and to thrive, that it is important that human beings also continue to exist. Because the, the, the care of the creation, let me just mention it, 
the stewardship imperative was linked to the human beings because God said, take care of the creation. But I'll, I'll give it its own treatment in a moment. So the species relies on us obeying that command. The creation relies on that. But also the institution of marriage in implied in the imperative, the command to reproduce is God's desire to, to uphold, to highlight that the institution of marriage should continue because it is within the context of marriage that God established the execution of the reproductive mandate. Are, are you following me? Yeah? So he performed essentially the first marriage by, by creating Eve out of Adam's rib, bringing her to Adam and, and, and blessing that. And then he said, be fruitful and multiply to that couple. Yeah? Similarly, arising out of that, the continuity of the institution of marriage is the continuity of the institution of marriage as being defined as that of one man to one woman. Because it is out of that, within that context, that the children that, were, that they were to produce was to come. Right? And linked to that is the continuity of kingdom values. That the laws and the ordinances of Yahweh should continue as the family reproduces, the family is commanded to pass on the laws, the ordinances, the commands of Yahweh to the next generation. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 1 to 6 is the premier passage about that. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And you shall have no other God before him. When you go into the land to possess the land, ensure that these laws, these commandments, are repeated to your children. Teach it to them when you sit down, when you rise in the morning, when you sit down to have your meals, when they go to bed at night. Keep them as frontlets or like a, a glasses lens before your eyes. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your houses and your gates. Tie them to the edge of your garments. What was that about? The older generation who had left in Egypt the bondage had all died out in the wilderness because of their disobedience. This is the new generation that has been born in the wilderness. You see, they were doing what? They were fulfilling the reproductive mandate. They were traveling through the wilderness, being guided by the cloud and the fire, and eating manna, and having sex. The children of Israel were journeying from bondage in Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. They got into the wilderness of Zin. Moses got the tablet with the, with the, with the, with the, um, the Decalogue. They were traveling along. They were fighting off Og, the king of Bashan, and the different kings who opposed them. They were eating manna. They were grumbling for water in the wilderness, and they were having sex. And after 40 years, 
the, the picking them that were born from the sex that they were having in the wilderness grew up and the older ones died and a new generation is there and God says to Moses be careful make sure that you tell the people that when they get into this land that they must ensure the continuity of the kingdom values now watch this years ago years ago the western world this side of the hemis of the of the hemisphere this side the, from the atlantic come this way if you remember your globe right so there, you have the atlantic ocean then you have uh, the americas canada uh, north north america canada usa south central america the caribbean islands the Western world had a minority population of uh, people of the Muslim faith. Years ago, people of the Muslim faith migrated to the Western world migrated to the western world and they continued having sex and making babies and the babies that they had they sat them down and what did they teach them western values they taught them the quran they introduced them to Allah. In some cases, they taught them jihad. They taught them the words in Arab Arabic, Aloha Akbar. The last words, the final words that a suicide bomber, one who is of the radical fundamental Muslim orientation, the last words that they will utter before they pull that bomb that they have attached to themselves, a suicide bomber, they will shout out in Arabic, Aloha Akbar. Now hear me, if you, if you, well, whether it's here or in the Caribbean or especially if you are in North America or in Europe and you're out in public, you're outside and you hear the words Aloha Akbar, you just might want to say your last prayer. Like literally. Because if you hear those words, quite likely a bomb is about to go off. Or bullets are about to start spraying. Yeah? And, and, and I'm not trying to stereotype, I'm just letting us know the reality. The point is that now, 10, 15, 20 years later, there are Muslim Senators. And legislators. People in high positions of authority in nations across the Western world. Reproduction is an essential methodology of spreading and continuing philosophies and ideas. And God is no different. What is, what, what is the implication for us? We must therefore understand that for the child of God, childbearing is far more than being able to say, yes, I have a child. Whatever satisfaction, whatever, whatever um, cause to, to boast about, and especially the man, then we know in, in, in Jamaica in particular, in, in the Caribbean on a whole, is a big thing for a man to get a youth. And, and, and women who don't have a child or have difficulty bearing a child are sometimes mocked and called mules and all that stuff. So yeah, it's, it's an achievement to have a child. But for the child of God, your children that you produce, 
God's idea is far more than that you are blessed with a child. In God's mind, the mandate, the imperative is that we ensure that we pass on the kingdom values. And the extent to which, let me prove this for us, the extent to which Jamaica stay how Jamaica stay right now is the extent to which parents gradually began to fail in that regard. The typical parent in Jamaica today, under 30, if you sit with them for five minutes and have a conversation, you will realize that their values, their worldview, their concept of, oh, of how the world works, their concept of right and wrong is a million miles away from biblical concepts and biblical values and biblical expectations. If and when they have a child, what then do you expect they will pass on to that child? There was a time when adults believed that lying is wrong and that stealing is wrong. You see people things and you leave it alone. You do not lie. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the Decalogue. They may not come to Sabbath worship to recite the Decalogue, but the fundamentals of the Decalogue were imprinted in the minds and the hearts of the typical Caribbean adult. And that is what they deliberately, they intentionally passed on to their children. Fast forward to today's reality where parents are sitting their two-year-old child down and teaching that child how to lie. Teaching that child how to, how to thief. Sending that child to thief. Hello? The choppy line. Teaching their nine-year-old girl how to take away a girl man. Don't look, don't look at me like, oh, no, 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 what am I talking about? I told you I'm a public theologian. I don't beat around the bush. I confront real life issues. Parents, because she is 19 and she got pregnant by taking away a wife's husband. And so her, her, when her girl gets to be eight, she's teaching her eight-year-old girl how to take away a woman man. Before, 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 the parents would be teaching their girls, do not trouble a married man. So it's, it's, it's not just about having children. The biblical imperative to be fruitful and multiply was part of God's idea of how his kingdom values would continue into perpetuity. And once we fail to take personal responsibility for instilling the values. Look, look at the multiple repetitive nature of Deuteronomy chapter 6. And by the way, that passage is the center of the entire Bible. The book of Deuteronomy is the center of the entire Bible. It is called the Bible key. And Deuteronomy chapter 6 is the center of the entire Bible. You know why? When Jesus was asked about salvation by, the, by the, the young lawyer, how do I gain salvation? 
Jesus' response came right out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. On these things, says Jesus, hang all of the law and the prophets. And that's the context in which God, through Moses, wanted the people to hear. Make sure that you pass this on to these, to these people here who are going into the land so that they can continue to pass it on. And to this very day, in the home of every Orthodox Jew, when they sit down to have their meals, and the entire family sits down to have their meal, they recite Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. It is called the Shema. From the first word, the first Hebrew word in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Shema Yisrael Yahweh Eloheinu Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. At every meal. And do you know that that is one of the fundamental reasons why the Jewish people have been preserved through all these generations. Despite several attempts to extinguish them and their memory from the face of the earth. Not the least of which is the Holocaust led by Adolf Hitler. There are no more any Hittites. There are no more any Jebusites. There are no more any Gergashites. And all of the ites that you read about in the book of Judges and in, and in the Old Testament, they are no more. They do not exist. The Hebrew people are the only people group that existed from that time till now other people groups have undergone the, in, in terms of as a as a whole right so yes you have egyptians and so on we're talking about as a whole and by the way just to further make the point it has been documented that adolf hitler perhaps the world the worst dictator that the world has witnessed who set out on a campaign to, to do what? To annihilate Jews from the face of the earth. That Adolf Hitler himself was a Jew. He grew up in a Jewish home with Jewish parents who had them sit at every meal and recite the Shema. But he watched his, shop, his father who owned a shop set up dishonest scales and doctor the books and other unethical practices and he became increasingly disillusioned by the hypocrisy he became increasingly disillusioned by seeing his father have them recite words that spoke about a God who requires holiness and who wanted his people through all time to follow his laws and his commands. He saw his father do that at every meal and then he watched his father live the exact opposite in his business. And he broke away from that and that was the beginning of the creation of a monster and that helps to explain why he turned out wanting to exterminate the Jews the reproductive mandate the stewardship mandate which I mentioned earlier on <laughs> heavy stuff <laughs> right? take care of the creation what is the implication? Fill the earth, tend the garden, take care of the creation. A command from God. No Christian 
should be walking on the road or in a vehicle and throwing garbage out the window. Growing up, the old folks told us cleanliness is next to godliness. And they, they, they said it so much that they made us believe that it was actually a Bible verse. Well, it's, it's actually not a Bible verse. <laughs> but it is, it comes as close as anything because it represents the, the ethos of, 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 of Bible. That we are expected to steward the creation. You cannot be a follower of God and be throwing garbage in the gully. Let me say it again. You cannot be a citizen of the kingdom and throwing garbage in the gully. Take care of the creation. Steward the creation. You notice how hot it is? Have you noticed? Have you noticed how hot it is in the nights, in the summer? Well, guess what? The physiologists are telling us that we are getting to what they are calling climate departure. That in a, in a very short time, listen carefully, because I want you to get this. The hottest night now is going to be the coldest night then let me let me say it differently as hot as the nights are right now this summer with temperatures of 32 and 33 degrees at 11 p.m and you are sweating and the fan blowing on you and you're still a sweat that is going to be like if it is cold not too long from now in other words it is going to get hotter and hotter and hotter because we have abused the creation. We found out that we can burn green trees to make coal and sell that to make money. And so we set about to cut down anything will look like a tree. In the pursuit of mammon. And in mankind's capitalistic pursuit, we have raped the creation. The hillsides are nude. We talk about Haiti under a curse every time we hear of flooding. Well, that, that may be so, but there are natural laws. There are no trees on the hillsides in Haiti because of abusive coal burning practices. If there are no trees on the hillside, when the rain falls, the water is going to hit the earth and it cannot soak into the earth. It is going to run off in volumes and it is going to flood the flatland. It is no obia, it is no magic, it is no divine nothing. It is the result of man's abuse of the environment. Now, of course, there are spiritual things happening at different levels. And the government spent millions of dollars building this wonderful promenade, promenade from downtown Kingston going across towards, um, uh, what's the street that the, the GP is on, that road? Um, going out towards, towards Windward, going out towards um, the, the fishing village and so on. Beautiful with the seawall and, and lovely sidewalk and, and so on. If you ever step out of a vehicle there, the stench from the Kingston Harbor will kick you down like Bruce Lee. I see man fishing in the Kingston Harbor more while. And I pray to God that none of them fish they not end up in a no supermarket or any fish shop to happen to end up on my plate. I don't want a fish out of the Kingston Harbor if you're giving it to me for free. Because all of the sewage 
that you see running on the streets downtown and the different places all of the garbage from the gullies that we throw in the gullies it makes its way into the Kingston Harbor when you're driving to Port Royal you see all the plastic if you don't mind if you write your name on a plastic bottle and throw it in a gully if you don't mind shop you can pick it up on, at the mangrove roots on the road to Port Royal that's that's part of holiness too we don't talk about that, do we? Divine impersonal. So the family, in your family, you must have a concept that says God made the creation and he saw that it was good and he blessed it and he said to the couple, take care of this. The ground I give you to produce all the food and all the animals and the plants are for your food. human beings we have abused it and when jesus came to to seek and to save that which was lost it wasn't just human souls the creation read romans chapter romans chapter 8 paul says since the fall the creation is groaning in anticipation of its deliverance so we have a stewardship mandate to govern the earth and to take care of the environment. When the mandate says take care of the earth, govern, rule it, God made us to be rulers over the creation. Therefore, no kingdom member should be bowing down to any created thing. Hello? Thou shalt have no other God before me and thou shalt not fashion any graven image. And bow thyself down unto it. Why? Because God made us in his image and his likeness. And he says, govern this. You have no business bowing down to an idol made of wood. Because God appointed you as ruler over the plants. You have no business bowing down to a figury of a cow or a giraffe or whatever. Because that is part of the creation that God said to the human beings, govern this you have no business bowing down to gold or silver or platinum or selling your soul and selling your dignity for a piece of gold or some silver because God appointed you as leader and governor over this when we therefore sell ourselves in the pursuit of the materials that earth produces we have violated the stewardship imperative. We must instill in our family how to relate to the creation. The creation is to serve us, not us serving the creation. That's why God said, have no other God before me. Because as the one who made this and appointed us to rule over it, he alone deserves our worship. But isn't that what we sing? For he alone is worthy. We sing it. <laughs> but our reality so often is very different. Huh? And then the, the mandate, the imperative to the different uh, members of the family. It's all about the, the man in the family, the woman in the family, and the children in the family. All right? And uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to zoom through this so we can have some time for a couple of questions. So the man, the male, the male appointed by God as the spiritual head, as the provider, the protector, those are divine imperatives. So again, every effort to emasculate our men. Every time the man abdicates, every time the man fails to stand in his position in the family as the leader of his family, as the spiritual head of his family, as the provider for his family. The Bible is very clear. 
the biblical imperative does not anticipate a lazy man. A lazy human being overall. But, but a little more emphasis and stress is placed on the male. Something is desperately wrong with our society because so many of our men are comfortable doing nothing with themselves. Comfortable being idle. Something inside of the man that the male of the species that God put there is supposed to revolt against idleness. And we see so many of our males absolutely comfortable with being idle without being meaningfully occupied. You wake up every day. Nothing now go on. You wake up every day from the day start to the day finish. As long as you can need your, your middle and bill a spliff and get a little one cup of a boom and rum, you're good. Something is wrong. Nothing. No pursuit of purpose. We were not made nor meant to be this way as males. Something has gone drastically wrong when so many of our males are comfortable not fulfilling the divine imperative of being a father to the children that they have helped to bring into the world. A man is not supposed to be comfortable not being involved in the life of his children. A male is not supposed to be comfortable not providing financially for his children. And so we are in serious trouble. Because the male is supposed to represent be the physical representation of all that the Bible intends for us to understand about the, the spiritual reality of God as our Father. And that is why so many of us in church have a twisted relationship with God as our Father simply because we had no relationship with our own biological fathers. Because it is the father who was supposed to, to model and exemplify everything about who God is. In his care, in his forgiveness, in his grace, in his, in his nurturing, in his protection, in his guidance. The divine imperative to the man is to be a father. And where that is missing, the land is cursed. Malachi speaks, Malachi chapter 4, the prophecy concerning the ministry of John the Baptist. Listen to what, God, what, what Malachi says. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. God intends that there is to be a harmonious relationship between children and their fathers. The ladies who are actively sowing hatred for their fathers in the hearts of their children are on dangerous grounds. And, and God says, or else in Malachi, I will come and strike the land with a curse. Where the hearts of the children are not turned to the fathers, and the hearts of the fathers are not turned to their children, the land is under a curse. Jamaica is under that curse. And John the Baptist, the ministry of John the Baptist, was in part 
to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Our ministry, the mandate, the imperative, is to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Starting with our own fathers in our churches, who will then go and reach other men so that their hearts can be towards their children. Holy power work. Yeah? Um, heavy stuff. Because when, when that is not... Look at, look at the result. Men commit 90% of major crimes. Men commit nearly 100% of rapes. Men commit 95% of burglaries. Men commit 91% of offenses against the family. Men comprise 94% comprise, comprise of drunk drivers. We have a national problem. We have a crisis in Jamaica because we have a man problem in Jamaica. The divine imperative is that the men be the fathers that God intends them to be. All right? And uh, so that's a little bit on the men because the, the, the time is, is gone. And then in, 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 in Genesis 48, we see the, the opposite. We see an example of, of how a father executes what he is supposed to execute in the life of his children to provide them with their identity, their sense of belonging, and their sense of purpose in the, the, the impartation of the blessing. When Israel called his, ten, his 12 sons to his bedside, put his hand on their head, each of them individually, and spoke words of a powerful and preferred future over their lives. He gave them a sense of worth, a sense of belonging, and a sense of purpose. That's a biblical, that's a divine imperative. And when that is missing, we have people who are hostile, people who are ungrateful, people who are insecure, people who are inexpressive, people who self-sabotage. The females, quickly. What is the biblical imperative to, for the females? Just a small part of it. Taken from the epistles of Paul in Ephesians and Colossians in particular. And, and, and Peter's letters. The females in the family are expected to be a model of decency, humility, and holiness. They are expected to participate in the discipleship project. How? Specifically, by teaching the younger women how to be good wives. That's a biblical imperative. If you are old and gray, and if you can boast about having been married for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, there is a biblical command upon your life to pass on to the younger wives and wives-to-be. And if you are not doing that, you are living in disobedience. It's not just to beat your chest about how long you have been married. It is about how much of that you are prepared to pass on to the younger women. Participate in the discipleship project by abstaining from slander and gossip. A biblical imperative. Paul says, they must not be diabolos. That's the word that he used for slanderers or gossipers. And if, you, if, if, if it sounds to you that that word there in the Greek that I just spoke, sounds like diabolic, you are very correct. Watch this. The devil is described as a liar from the beginning and the father of lies. 
as a slanderer, and Satan literally means the accuser of the brethren. And it is the exact same word that the Apostle Paul uses when he says that the older women should not be slanderers or gossipers. And if there is one clear example of disobedience in churches, it is this. Too much Far too much slandering and gossiping is taking place. And it is very often largely the actions of the older women. Stop it. The Bible commands that it must not be done. The Bible equates that activity with Satan himself because that's the nature of Satan. Proverbs says, these six things the Lord hates, yea, seven are an abomination. You know what's the seventh one? A person who sows discord among brethren. You want to see a, a good church mashup? Wait till the, the slanderers get to work. Hey, come here, sister. You, you know, hear me here. If you see the young sister looking like suddenly she wants to turn money, money. It is not an invitation for you to start slandering the young sister. It is an invitation for you to draw near to the young sister. To find out what's happening. To begin to pray. If you feel like you can't talk to her. You don't know if we talk to her. And you don't know what we do. One thing you know if we do. Go down on your knees. And start praying for the sister. Say God I'm afraid for talk to her. But raise up another sister for talk to her. Because she's been like the road. Where she seemed to be going down on. But for heaven's sake. Stop the gossiping and the slandering. It has caused an abundance of hurt to people both in and outside of the church. Can I, can I be brutally honest with you? If it was up to slander and gossip, me, that you're looking on right now, I would stay a million miles away from church. Me. Because from I was a teenager, I have been terribly hurt by slander and gossip of church people. What have to do better? Divine imperatives for the family. So the, the, the females in particular are highlighted. And, and boy, trust me, if it's one to me can't deal with, and I, and I don't mean to be sexist or genderist. But if it's one thing we can deal with, is a man with chatty tatty and love gossip. That, that, that is a million times worse in my book. Right? Whoever it is, male or female, it is wrong, it is destructive, it is of the devil. You are leaving yourself loose and idle for the devil to ride you and use you. And, and a whole heap of repentance need for go on in a God church when it come on to slander and gossip. Right? Sometimes all in a prayer meeting, we, 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 we go on like his prayer request we're making, but we just want to spread gossip and rumor. We're not really interested in prayer request. We just know something or we hear something and we can't wait to chat what we hear or we think we know. Or oh, after the better. All right. But I didn't come here to, to quarrel with you. Just delivering a seminar. And lastly, to, uh, the, on this, in terms of the children. Biblical imperatives for the family in terms of children. And we are all of us are somebody, right? <laughs> honor, to honor parents. We have gotten to a place in our, in our nation where the, the concept of honor has been lost. 
honor for the elderly and honor for parents. I'm, years ago, I remember years ago, a, a lady, an elderly lady called me and she said, Pastor, I don't know where to do. Because I have a little grandchild where I stay with me and, and Pastor, the boy, I give me hell. I put recently too. Where was I? I? I spoke somewhere and at the end, this little elderly sister came up to me and I was saying a similar thing. And it, it was, a, 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 it was a, a difficult moment for me because I am trying to go back in my mind. Yeah? I mean, yes, yeah, I, I know I'm, I'm from a different era. I was born in the late 70s. And a whole heap of things started changing in the 80s and it, from the 90s. And, and the horse started galloping even faster. Right? The horse going at, at breakneck speed. No, not even a horse now. It's speed train now in terms of the degeneration of values and, and, and so on. So, so me who grew up a certain way now, I try to figure out how it is that an eight-year-old boy is living in a house with his grandmother. And he is so disrespectful to the point that the lady is at her wit's end. The lady is about to have, to have a cardiac arrest from the stress that the little boy is giving her. I'm like, how, how, how did we get here though? But then, when you have, uh, when you have parents teaching their, their two-year-old who is just learning to talk, teaching them how to cause bad word, like, like legit teaching them how to cause bad word. But here, what do we expect? It, it goes back to the, divine, the first one. To, to pass on the values. We, we have failed colossally in this regard. And, and, and any hope there is has to arise again from the people of the church having a renewed commitment to this, to this project. Not just with our own children, but even with the, the children in the church and the children in the community. It is not going to fix itself. Because if the principles of societal change remain the same, if the church remains aloof and disconnected and disjointed from the community, somebody has to be prepared to go on the lanes and all the roads of Chisholm Avenue on a little corner where a couple parents are gathered and have a little discussion with them about what it means to be a parent and about how to raise children with respect again. We, we, we wonder how it is that we're hearing about somebody getting stabbed up because they were at a dance and him happened to brush against a man's shirt. Are you, are you, oh, oh, oh my goodness, the, the, the young girl from Grand Spen. The report said that the one girl in the group who attacked her said she, she never liked how the girl looked on her and said she a preemie. Well, look. But, but we, have, we have abandoned the divine imperatives. The principles that are intended as the glue that holds society together. We have abandoned them. And the society is tearing apart at the seams. But there is still hope because we still have the word of God. We still have the power of God. So children are expected, divine imperatives, to honor our parents. We can talk about respect and so on, right? Um, my boss, a, a lady, um, most persons call her by her first name, um, Claudette. But again, me, the me, how I was raised. If, if, if Claudette happened to come out of my mouth, me feel away. It just not feel right. So I always address her as miss. Yeah? Some basic things. Every now and then I walk into a space where people are and I, and I say good morning and, and, and nobody answers. And then it, it, it hits me again. That, that's, the that's the reality. That's now the reality. 
but it did not come out of me because that's how I was raised. Yeah? We have to go back to instilling the basics of honor for our parents and for the elderly. The, 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 the divine imperative for, of geriatric care of parents. What does that mean? That the Bible actually gives us instructions to take care of our parents when they get old. Again, that's something that you could, you could have taken for granted years ago. You can't anymore. Them just no business. I have to deal with it. Lato has to deal with it. Sakedish has to deal with it. We were in the helping professions. The social workers, the counselors. When we come upon these elderly people, destitute, in, 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 in horrible conditions, and then you ask, every now and then you see them on the news. A man in, a, in, 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 in something we're not even, not, if I have a pet rat, I'm not going to put him in there, sir. And I ask myself, this, this man had no children? Well, perhaps some of them may have no children. This man has no siblings. And then I go down the line. Is there no church near to where this man lives? Something is very wrong again in a society that turns its back on its most vulnerable. Of among whom are the geriatric population. God bless Father Holong and the missionaries of the poor. God bless the, um, the uh, elder, I forgot his name now, the elder with the Seventh-day Adventist group with their, their facility on Slipe Road. It, it, it was expected. We will abandon them and then it, 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 it burned me when the person dies. Picnic come out from Woi Woi. And then one go a bright light. Because yo, him, him afi, him, yo, my, my father have to ride, go dove cut in a chariot. Move from here so with that man. When your daddy was alive, him did have to send come beg, come at church. For some little dollars to buy him basic insulin medica medication. And if him have an x-ray for do, him have to beg, and we have to walk and beg donation for him, go get an x-ray done. Where were you? You buy your one, come and, and kill goat, and how much hog, and drinks, and keep big splash. Select every night, boy, you have nine nights for daddy. And your daddy suffered in indignity in his last days. You want Cadillac for pool, uh, um, glass case chariot for carry your daddy go a dove cut. And you want to come down, come floss and show off and dash out money. Our society has gotten very sick. Divine imperatives. And we, we, are the, we have to walk it back and restore some dignity to, 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 to death and dying and the process of grieving. If I have anything to do with that, that burial process and that funeral, it is going to be conducted with dignity. You're not going to come into the church, come turn this into a dance hall or a dance session. You will, you will dress decently to come and, and read the reading. You're not going to dress like you're going to dance to come and do me memorial and, and, um, and, and remembrance and, and all of that. We have to return a sense of solemnity. Somebody has died. We have lost somebody. It's not a party. Solomon says in Proverbs, it is better to be at the house of the dead than to be at a dance. But we want to turn everything into a dance. Wear bright colors. No. There is still value in wearing black because we are we symbolically it is identified with mourning and with grieving. We are bright colors for what? And do, and oh, we must only sing happy songs. No, there is still a value in singing a slow, mournful ballad 
because we are, we are marking the passing of a human being. When we turn everything into merriment, we get what we reap. We reap what we sow. And then the youth are expected to be defenders of the truth. I write to you young, young men because you are strong. So the youth in the family, the children, have a divine imperative to stand up for the truth, to be defenders of the truth, to pursue truth and to follow truth and to stand up for what is right. So there's, 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 a, there's a, a command for everybody. There are instructions and imperatives for everyone. We must each know, seek to discover what have I left undone? What do I need to do more of? Am I fulfilling the divine imperatives? God, where do I need to make the adjustments so that Jamaica under God may increase in beauty, fellowship, and play her part in advancing the welfare of the entire human race? God bless you. See right here, sir. I, I st I, I, I'm not the moderator. I, I don't know where it is, but I want to, I stand today to say that my faith has been refreshed by this presentation. The theme of the convention is what? Refreshing our faith to do greater works. And sir, with what you just said right there, my faith is refreshed. Am I alone? Listen. It, it broke my heart and at the same time it empowered me. To, 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 to see that the word of God encapsulate what the society that we live in should be and, and seeing the opposite and what it is doing to us. We, we need to pray. We need to... If, if I never felt like seeking God before this convention start, I feel like seeking God no. I feel like I want to man up. Uh, the work is cut out for us. And if it was hidden before and we never see it in the scriptures, all we are read, what you have just done by using the word of God is clearly putting before us the work that we should be doing. We are supposed to rescue this world because it is in need of rescuing. What you said about people and how they treat funerals, I am the caretaker here and I see it. I see how people dress and come to funeral to say they are... I don't even know because me think they are sting. I want to bless you, sir. I, 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 I don't know you, but I want to bless you. And I pray that God will continue to empower you. And I pray that the devil will lose in every battle that he decides to come up with against your life and ministry. We need more men like you who will stand up. I don't know what church did to you, but I'm glad that you never let it cause you not to stand because I would not have sat here today and, my, and have my faith refreshed. Hallelujah. Somebody give God a praise. We are blessed by what you have offered today. And I'm glad that the Lord brought you here safely to dispense this. I know there is more to it. And I do believe that maybe we go have a call you back. Because this should not be done with a few 
persons here. This is something that should be done with the congregation in full flight. For all the way to the balcony. We need this, brethren. Simply put, we needed this. God bless you. God bless you, my brother. Say again. Yes. Sure. And if anybody have a question or anything that they would want to, if, if, if there's something was left on your heart by this presentation, please come. Because I would love for this fire to continue blazing. Hello? Okay. All right. Praise God. See technician all around the place who is verse and verse and doing stuff. Yeah. I just came in and just hear the last part, just about five minutes of what this gentleman is saying. And I do not know the name of all of you who are sitting here now, but you might know me, right? Let me see the hands of those who know me. Okay, very few. <clears throat> he had do a very, very powerful presentation. And I endorse your sentiment, sir. Very powerful presentation. And when I came in, I hear it. And I look around, I see five men. Five men. And myself make six. I said, no, this is not right. It's convention, we all should be here. <clears throat> let me tell you, I'll, I'll just ask for five minutes and let me be brief in everything. God save you and you and you and you for a purpose. You and you and you and you here are flaming angels and earth here for God. You are God, we are God representative here on earth. And from the moment you get saved, being saved, being in touch, being in contact with God. God have gave you a charge. Read Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4. I give you that specifically verse. Verse 4. Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4. You will know that we all have a duty. We don't, we don't just get saved to come and make friends with everybody, you know. No. God save us for a purpose. Lay out his laws for a purpose. And too many times, too many times, we make void. We make a fool of ourselves. Coming to the congregation. Coming so we come to church. And just to jump around. But you got to know your purpose in God. Let me quote the verse that I just repeat. Ezekiel 9, verse 4. He says, Go into the street of Jerusalem. Set a mark upon them that sigh and cry for the abomination. A few weeks ago I asked in church if the Lord should come. No, let me see the hands of all those who read it.